All right, Rascals, we're back. It is chapter 16.3. It is Thursday, May 14th, 2020. We're going to be looking at pages 522 to 529 in your book. The title of the chapter is No End in Sight. So let's get started. All right, learning objective for today. I can name specific victories for both the Union and Confederacy, which had significant impacts on the outcome of the Civil War. So let's do a little bit of review first. So we know we, where we left off. Uh, the Civil War began in 1861 with the attack on Fort Sumter in the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The Confederacy, or the CSA, won an early victory at the Battle of Bull Run, also known as Manassas. George McClellan was named commander of all Union armies in the East, and soldiers on both sides rushed to join the fight. All right, so a little bit more review. We're going to be using uh, um, names like Eastern Theater, Western Theater, and Trans-Mississippi as we go forward. So it's a good idea to actually take a look at what those terms mean and what regions that they refer to. So theaters when we're talking about war, refer to geographic areas. This doesn't talk about movie theaters or anything like that. So just the region or area where, where um, events take place. So in the Eastern Theater, we have it broken off from the rest of the states over here. That is mainly Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. In the Western Theater, we have a large area. We have Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, and North Carolina. This would be the Western Theater, even though it's still in the eastern part of the United States. We call it the Western Theater in this conflict. And then the Trans-Mississippi Theater, which is everything on the other side of the Mississippi River. So we have Missouri, Colorado, Indian Territory, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and New Mexico. Yes, they did fight uh, out, out that far west. Uh, let's see, key figures. George McClellan. So after the disastrous loss at Bull Run or Manassas, Union armies feel defeated and they lack confidence. Remember, they were hoping to go in there and wrap up the war in just one victory, and that is not what happened. So President Abraham Lincoln gives command of the Union Army of the East or the Eastern Theater, that we just talked about, to George McClellan. This is a picture of McClellan over here. So McClellan does a couple of things that are positive. He restores the confidence of the army and he trains it well, but he's always going to have a difficult relationship with his commander-in-chief, meaning Lincoln, because Lincoln, see, Lincoln believes that McClellan, although he's great at training armies, he's not um, eager to use them to attack the enemy, and this annoys Lincoln. Lincoln wants action right away, and McClellan doesn't provide it. This is going to be a source of conflict between these two guys for this whole year of the story we're going to be talking about the next couple days. Quick video on McClellan right there. Watch it. It's a minute and 45 seconds long. Okay, so McClellan is in charge in the East. Well, what's going on in the West? Well, the Union's having a lot of success in the West. They had that setback at, at uh, Bull Run and Manassas. But out in the West, there's some good things that are happening for the Union. So McClellan doesn't want to fight in the East, but General Ulysses S. Grant does want to fight in the West. So he wins two battles, one at a place called Fort Henry and then one at Fort Donelson. This is, if you look at this map right here, uh, this is Kentucky and this is Tennessee. And those two rivers, there are two rivers here, the Tennessee, which goes down like this, up through Alabama and back up into Tennessee by Chattanooga, and the Cumberland. They're really, really close to each other right here. That's where those two forts are, Henry and Donelson and Grant. Well, one Henry first and then Donelson, which gave the Union control of these rivers that allow them to travel like these are highways into the heart of the Confederacy. Look, they can go all the way down into the deep south in Alabama once they have control of these rivers. And that's what they get from those two victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Another big battle out in the uh, west shortly after the victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson happens at a place called Pittsburgh Landing in southern Tennessee, close to the border of Mississippi. The battle there is called Shiloh. So after Grant's victories at Fort Henry and Donelson, he and his troops march south into Tennessee. And the Confederate troops at the time, they retreat to a place called Corinth, Mississippi. There's some critical railroads there that need to be protected. So Grant and his men stop at Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, right here. And they wait for reinforcements, which means more soldiers to come, before they pursue the Confederates in Corinth, which is about 22 miles away. I know that because I've been there. 
So here's a key figure from the Civil War that you may not have heard of before, Albert Sidney Johnston. So he's a Confederate. He fought in the United States Army for over 30 years. He fought in the Texas Revolution, the Mexican-American War, and in the Civil War. The reason you've probably not heard about him, although he was really, really um, highly respected by the Confederacy. In fact, he was believed to be the top soldier in the Confederacy, or maybe on both sides of this war when the war started. The reason you haven't heard about him is he doesn't last very long in the war. He's going to die pretty early on. So he becomes the commander of Confederate armies in the Western Theater. He faces Grant at the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862. So here's what happens at Shiloh. It was craziness. This was just They called it a murderous fist fight before with these armies just slamming away at each other in the woods in Tennessee. So Johnston's men attack on April 6th while Grant was waiting for reinforcements. Their Union is completely caught off guard and they run off the field. The fighting is fierce. It was the biggest battle in the war fought up to this point. Grant's men suffer heavy losses as they run off the field. But what Grant does, though, it's actually part of his strategy. He's trading space for time, meaning he's allowing his men to be run off the field because it gives him more time to wait for these reinforcements that are coming. And the reinforcements do arrive that night. So by the time April 7th rolls around the next day, the tables have turned. Grant, with his reinforcements, beat up the Confederates and drive them from the field. And they retreat. The Confederates retreat all the way back down 22 miles to Corinth, Mississippi. So when this battle is over, there were 23,000 casualties combined. And among them was Albert Sidney Johnston. He was shot through the leg that first day, leading a charge. The bullet hit an artery, and he bled to death into his own boot. And if you go to the Shiloh battlefield down in southern Tennessee, they have the spot where he died marked off with this plaque right here. So he's out of the war. It was a huge loss for the Confederacy so early in the war, too. Another great thing that happens in the West for the Union, the Union takes New Orleans, which at the time was the largest city in the South. It's down here. It was captured by a man named Admiral David Farragut, and he used warships to capture New Orleans. So you remember the Anaconda Plan for another, or from a couple days ago. One of the three parts of the Anaconda Plan was control of the Mississippi River. So they almost have it now. They've come down from Missouri all along Arkansas, and they've come up from New Orleans. There is a spot called Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is going to prevent the Union from controlling all of the Mississippi River until 1863. This is where things are going to be stuck. But they've got most of the Mississippi River under control at this point. So the South has great success in the East. We saw them getting beaten over in the Western Theater. It's a little bit different in the East. So... McClellan and his men slowly advance up the peninsula uh, in Virginia on their way to attack or to capture Richmond. You remember that was part of the uh, Anaconda plan, too. So they're going to go up this peninsula right here, around by the James and York rivers, and that's what they want to go for is Richmond, Virginia, right there. But they run into a problem, namely Robert E. Lee, who is now in charge of Confederate armies in the east. He sends his cavalry, which is uh, soldiers on horseback, to find McClellan's forces. They do, and the South wins a series of battles known as the Seven Days Battles, and it blocks the capture of Richmond, Virginia. So we see that's where the Anaconda Plan is shut down there. They're not going to capture Richmond at this point. So Robert E. Lee is becoming a legend in the East at this time. He renames his army the Army of Northern Virginia. You're going to want to remember that name. The South defeats the Union at the Second Battle of Bull Run, this time in 1862, on the same uh, area of land as the First Battle of Bull Run in 1861. Lee had ended the Union threat to Virginia, and the South is once again hopeful that they can win the war. So victories at um, Bull Run, the Second Bull Run, and the Seven Days Battles really uh, reinvigorate the confidence of the South. So Lee decides that now that he's had the success in Virginia, he's going to try to invade the North for the first time. So why would he want to? Why would he want to invade the North? Okay, because remember that was their idea. Their strategy was to be uh, 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 defensive armies. Their their strategy was defensive in this war. So if you're invading the North, that's offensive strategy. So why does he? Why does he do that? What does he believe will be beneficial for the South? So he thinks that if he has victory in the North. It would compel or force Lincoln into peace talks to end the war. An invasion of the North would also give farmers in Virginia a break during the harvest. The Confederates could steal food from northern farms. 
and also an invasion would prove that the South could win the war, and that if they did that, they would earn recognition, support, and respect from European countries, namely France and Britain. Remember, we depended heavily on assistance from the French in our War of Independence. Uh, the South here is hoping that they can count on the same foreign assistance and recognition during the Civil War. So they meet in the first invasion of the North at a place called Sharpsburg in Maryland. We call it the Battle of Antietam. Lee and McClellan meet there. McClellan found Lee's battle plans. Here's something crazy. McClellan is criticized a lot in history, and my opinion is he deserves a lot of it. So McClellan's men found Lee's battle plans, which indicated that Lee had split his army up, and they should, the North should have been able to destroy Lee's army with this information. But instead, McClellan does almost nothing for a whole day, allowing precious time to slip away. They finally engage in battle on September 17th, 1862. This becomes the deadliest single day in American history up to this point. It still is. 23,000 casualties in one day. Now, we said before at Shiloh there were 23,000 casualties. Yes, but that was over two days. This is one day, 23,000 dead, wounded, missing, captured. It was pretty much a tie. The only thing that made the Union claim it a victory was that the South, uh, their invasion of the North was stopped. So that's why the Union claimed it as a victory, even though it was just deadly on both sides. Here's Lincoln and McClellan. They, like I said before, they did not have a great relationship. Lincoln, after this, after uh, um, the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln hoped that McClellan would pursue or chase and follow Lee's army and, and wipe him out and finish him. Instead, McClellan did nothing. Lincoln's very unhappy about that. So here are some of the results of Antietam. The invasion of the North has stopped. Any hopes of the South being recognized by European countries or receiving supplies are squashed. It's not going to happen now. Lee retreats back to Virginia, but like I said, McClellan does not pursue Lee, and Lincoln's angry again. Finally, after all this disappointment, Lincoln fires McClellan and replaces him with a guy named Ambrose Burnside. This is Burnside right over here. Yes, we call him Sideburns, but we did get that name from this guy right here. Take a look at that facial hair. So McClellan is going to take over as commander of the Union armies in the east, but as we're going to find out shortly, he does not have much success in the east either against Robert E. Lee. 